All right, guys, I've got some great news for you because this year, billionaires got richer at an unprecedented pace. Yes! There's pretty substantial growth in the total value of billionaires. The rich are getting richer and they're <laughs> getting richer faster. I mean, that's the reality. Um, we had unprecedented growth this year in, in billionaire wealth. Now, obviously, those Bloomberg commentators are absolutely loving life right now. They love this news. Look at their joyful <laughs> little faces. Bless them. They're pretty much behaving like a financial gossip show there, aren't they? In reality, this isn't a particularly good thing. I mean, unless, of course, you are already a billionaire, are you? If not, then this is actually a bad thing as a whole for society. It could even be pushing us back to Victorian times. Now, I know that sounds odd, but let me explain. Check out this chart from the World Inequality Report. This chart shows us the share of global income of the top 1% of the population and the bottom 50% since 1980. So the top 1% of the population have over double the share of global income as half the population. And you know, I'm sure some of you will be sitting there thinking, yeah, but that's because the emerging nations are more densely populated and they have far more inequality. Well, if that's your argument, check out this chart of the United States. In the mid-1990s, the top 1% of US citizens overtook half the population in terms of share of national income. Now, usually when you talk about a topic like this, it tends to divide people into two categories. On one hand, you have people who think that this level of inequality is absolutely disgusting and something needs to be done about it. But then on the other hand, you have people who don't really see it as much of an issue at all. They just think this is an inevitable part of capitalism. But a few years ago, an economist called Thomas Piketty brought out a groundbreaking book called Capital in the 21st Century, where he shone a light on this issue and showed through extensive data why this is such a big problem. When it comes to inequality, Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century says we should all worry about capital, not so much incomes and bonuses. So, what does he mean by capital? Well, that's anything that can be owned and that generates an income. That can be housing, lands, stocks or shares. Now that idea isn't new. In fact, the link between capital and incomes is very familiar. His research found that in the 18th and 19th centuries, the value of capital grew faster than the economy at large. So, by 1900, the amount of wealth had grown to around seven times national output in Britain. And since that wealth started off being owned by rich people, that means that the rich pulled away from the rest of us. So the way that the rich keep getting so much richer than everyone else is based on a simple equation which underpins Piketty's work. R is greater than G. R is return on capital historically 4 to 5 percent a year. And G is for economic growth. For most of human history, less than 0.1 percent a year, almost zero, because population grew slowly and agricultural productivity more slowly still. So if R is growing at 4 to 5 percent a year in economies that are barely growing at all, it's pretty obvious that those who have the capital, the rich, will keep getting richer and inequality will grow. Now, this is what Piketty found from his data was happening up until the First World War. During Victorian times, people were born into massive amounts of wealth that were accumulated from their family over time. And there were very few ways to generate this sort of wealth other than marrying into these families. These super wealthy people didn't need to work to generate an income because they generated enough income to live off from their capital, from things like rent and dividends. That was until the First World War when assets got destroyed, obviously, and redistributed. This led to a period of recovery until eventually things changed again and continued on the path that they were going in before. Capital has been growing faster than the economy at large. And since the rich start off owning more stuff, that drives up inequality. So far, so uncontroversial. But Piketty's thesis is that this trend might well continue. And if the rate at which capital grows remains faster than the growth of the economy at large, then the rich will keep pulling away. And the world could look, once again, like a Victorian age. 
The rich will be rich because of who their parents are, not who they are. And that's a major public policy challenge. Now, some of you may say that this is just how capitalism works and you need that incentive of being able to achieve huge amounts of wealth in order to encourage productivity and growth, which is good for the economy as a whole. But actually, that's not quite the case. One of the arguments uh, against your, your, your point of view is that uh, economic inequality is not only a feature of capitalism, but is actually one of its engines. So we take measures to lower inequality and at the same time we lower growth, potentially. What do you answer to that? Yeah, I think inequality is not a problem per se. You know, I think inequality up to a point can actually be useful for innovation and growth. The problem is it's a question of degree. Uh, when inequality gets too extreme, then it becomes uh, useless for growth and it can even become bad because it tends to lead to high perpetuation of inequality over time and, and low uh, mobility. And for instance, you know, the, the kind of wealth concentration that we had uh, in the 19th century and, and pretty much until World War I in every European country was, I think, not useful for growth. You know, this was destroyed by a combination of tragic events and policy changes, and this did not prevent growth from happening. And also extreme inequality can be uh, bad for our democratic institution if it creates very unequal access to political voice you know, the influence of private money in uh, US politics, you know, I think is a matter of, of concern right now. So, you know, we don't want to return to that kind of extreme pre-World War I inequality. Uh, having a, a decent share of national wealth for the middle class, you know, it's not bad uh, for growth. You know, it, it is actually useful both for equity and efficiency reason. Now, I hope you're paying attention to what Piketty said there, because what he mentioned about politics in particular is really important. The people with the largest amounts of wealth with the biggest loads of money are going to have the biggest voices in the political arena. And this has certainly been the case over the years in US politics in particular. However, it's because of situations like this that things like populism start to gain traction. And we've seen that taking place around the world in recent years. People look at their own situation, they look at the difficulties that they have to overcome, the struggles that they deal with, and they look at what's the cause of it, who can they blame. They start looking at external factors rather than the system itself. Of course they start blaming the government, but then they also start looking at things like immigration and blaming that. And this can lead to social unrest, which is then going to cause people to be more angry and start directing the anger and the blame at the establishment and those people who are holding that concentration of wealth. In fact, in an essay all the way back in 1889, Andrew <laughs> Carnegie really hit the nail on the head. He said that citizens can accept some of the problems being caused by capitalism, but only if philanthropists use some of their income, these are the people that are benefiting from the concentration of wealth, if they use some of their income to address and to try and solve some of those problems. Unfortunately, the reality of the situation is that it seems billionaires just can't give away their money quickly enough. This article from The Atlantic talks about the Giving Pledge, which was signed by people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Now, Paul Allen, who was a co-founder of Microsoft, was worth $13.5 billion when he signed the pledge. In the next six years, he gave away $2 billion before he unfortunately died. But at the time of his death, he was worth $20 billion, which is 48% higher than when he signed the pledge. So in other words, he was giving away money, but he was making money much quicker than it was possible for him to give away. As I mentioned earlier in the video, solutions to this problem, which is only going to get worse and worse, in the past have been things like war and confiscation, but I'm sure we can all agree that there must be a more peaceful alternative that we can take than one of those things. In fact, Thomas Piketty does offer his own more peaceful solution. He suggests the implementation of a wealth tax, which accumulates over the years and helps to redistribute some of that wealth. Now, people may say that that's not feasible, but as he quite rightly points out, Central banks have been redistributing wealth for years. It's just that they haven't been doing it democratically or transparently. 
But you know, a potential issue with this solution is that a lot of this concentration of wealth is now happening in places like China. Yeah, Carol, it's, it's unprecedented. This is the Chinese century. Yeah. Think about it. If you think about China just alone, there were 16 billionaires in China in 2006. There's 373 billionaires in China today. A report from PwC showed how last year, on average, China had two new billionaires every week. And this shows no signs of slowing down. Um, can you just book me a flight to China, please? You know, I was thinking as I read through the report, um, you know, what does this mean kind of for the world financial order? In fact, an article by The Economist shows how China is having a gravitational pull on the world's economic output, leading to a shift in the geographic center of the global economy, which would now be somewhere near to Siberia. This is certainly looking like the Chinese century. With central bank stimulus and low interest rates in recent years contributing to the rise in the prices of financial assets, while at the same time seeing things like productivity and wage growth remaining very slow, it's no wonder that a situation like this has accelerated and why it could continue to accelerate until it does become a very big problem. But you know what? I would love to know your thoughts on this whole situation. What's your opinion on the topic? Do you think it's an inevitable part of capitalism and we just need to get on with it? Or are you disgusted by that level of inequality and you think something needs to be done about the situation? Let me know down in the comment section below and any other thoughts you have on this overall topic. And if you like this video and you'd like to see more videos about economic topics or economics in general, then hit that thumbs up button to let us know. And if you don't want to miss out on any of our videos about the financial markets, trading, investing, economics, and a whole lot more, then make sure you subscribe to the channel and switch on notifications. I really appreciate you watching. Take care and I'll see you soon.